So I will say, um, I'll start things off by saying, yes, it's hard to be the first speaker, uh, but if you ever get invited to speak at a conference or a forum like this, um, don't ever let them put you in the slot after the keynote. Right? You get these wonderful, thoughtful, uh, dynamic speakers, uh, and now you have me. So we'll try to do our best to kind of keep you engaged here as we go. Uh, so our theme uh, for this event is the evolution of cybersecurity automation. But I'm going to focus a little bit more narrowly, uh, specifically on the evolution of integrated adaptive cyber defense, right? Um, and the work that we've been doing here at, at Hopkins. So as I was preparing for this talk, I had the opportunity to go back and review a lot of the materials and some of the early work um, that uh, we've, we had done here uh, within the ICD portfolio. And uh, do we have any science fiction movie fans in the audience? Right. Okay, so have you ever gone back and you watched a science fiction movie from, that was produced in the 60s or 70s? You look at the cinematography, you look at the special effects, and you look at that and think, wow, how far have we come? Right. So that's kind of the feeling that I had as I went back and looked at some of the early work that we did with IECD was, wow, how far have we come? So first, let me ask, um, and Wendy, you don't get to answer this question. So um, does anybody have an idea of when we actually started and did our very first experiment around um, IECD and, and making this automation uh, concepts real? Anybody? All right, go ahead, Michael. About five years Right, exactly. Yep. July 2014. So think about the state of where things were at back in, uh, almost five years ago uh, when we first started and did this first experiment. Right? The, uh, there were a lot of cybersecurity tools and capabilities that we have folks have deployed on their networks. Uh, but you think about the orchestration market, right? It was nascent at best. Um, a lot of the capabilities that were there might have been really actually developed um, to deal with orchestration from a di different functional area, maybe not so much focused on cybersecurity. So it was just starting uh, in that marketplace and, and starting to evolve. Um, and think about what you were doing back in those days, right? Uh, our team from IECD, I'll use this as an example, has evolved a great deal, right? Um, I think about our, our senior sponsors at NSA and DHS. Uh, Mr. Phil Quaid was our sponsor at NSA. He is now retired and moved off into industry. Uh, Mr. Pete Fonash was our DHS senior sponsor. He's likewise retired and moved off and is teaching. Our IACD team was led by Ms. Wendy Peters, who is actually here today. Um, and she has moved on and is now working in the financial sector. Uh, at that time, I was still with NSA. Um, and it would be over a year before I would actually come here and join the IACD team. Uh, Kim Watson, our technical director, was uh, involved in IACD, but she was actually working at DHS and on the sponsor side of things, right? And, uh, and Kevin Cropper, our um, project manager, was actually working for the Peace Corps at that time. And then that brings us, last but not least, to Tim Walton. Um, <laughs> and yes, Tim, you know exactly where I'm going. So, uh, so Tim actually has been a continuity. He actually was here at APL working IECD back in, in uh, July of 14 and is still with the program today. But I will point out that at that time, Tim had and his wife had one child. They are now expecting their fourth child. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, a lot has happened since that time uh, for, for the team. And frankly, a lot has happened for IECD as well, right? Um, we are currently in our finishing up our 15th spiral, uh, which means our 16th spiral, really, because we started counting with, uh, with zero, as a good computer scientist uh, that we are. Um, so we have done a lot of work in terms of ex examining um, and experimenting with these concepts of automation and how they can be applied, um, all the way from the beginning of can you do it at all, to much more advanced thoughts and techniques and applying in, into different uh, environments like uh, ICS and control systems and things like that. We've also uh, pr produced an incredible amount of documentation and products for the community to help 
both the vendors understand the things that we think they need to be doing to help uh, improve the interoperability of our products, uh, but also to help those folks and organizations who want to adopt these concepts. So we've put a lot of material out there uh, over the last five years. Um, and I will say early on, even before I was part of this, this effort, um, it was realized that while it's important and, and certainly valuable to produce this material, we also needed to bring the community together, right? We needed to have folks come together and talk about the, this work. So our very first community day, and at that point we called it a community day, right? It was held about nine months later in March of, uh, of 2015, right? It was a half day event. It was held over uh, across the street here in what we call our Parsons Auditorium, which is about you know, a quarter, maybe a third of the size of this auditorium. We had about 40-ish or so people uh, maybe 20 to 25 organizations represented uh, in that forum. So a much smaller uh, event than what we have here today. And if you look, this is actually the agenda from our, our very first community day. And is, is there something you notice about this particular agenda? Okay. How about the fact that it is very focused on APL, right? It was about talking about the work and the research that we were doing here at APL and sharing that out with folks. Now that's valuable and that's important, right? And it, and it was a good thing, so that's, it's not meant to be a, a negative. But it was very much a very small community and very focused on, on what APL was doing. Now you fast forward about a year, or excuse me, two years, to March 2017, we held our last community day uh, here, at, here at APL. At that point, we were here in the, in the Kozakoff Center. Um, it had grown quite a bit over that time. We needed a bigger venue. Um, and what do you notice about this particular agenda? All right. Well, it is more externally focused, right? We started actually having the community coming in here as part of these events and talking and participating because there was work going on outside of just what was happening here at APL. Um, so that was a, a natural evolution of where we were going and what we needed to do. So in the fall of 17, we held our very first integrated cyber, right? Pretty much the event that you're, you're at today. Um, and it had grown dramatically, right? We had over 500 uh, folks register for that event. Um, you see the number of organizations, a tenfold increase from what we did in those very first uh, community days. Um, a, a much bigger event and a much bigger community. And the focus of those talks at that time were from the community. Right? There, sure, APL was talking about the things we were doing as we always have, um, but it was much, much more of a community event. Okay, so you may be thinking, well, this is all nice, this is you know, useful information, but so what? What's your point? Um, why are you kind of taking us through this, this uh, walk down memory lane? Uh, well, because I am here to say uh, and to announce that this actually will be our final integrated cyber that we will be holding here at, at APL. Um, now, you may be wondering, well, why is that? We've talked about all the work and the things that have happened up to this point. Um, so why is this the last one? So I'm gonna ask you to bear with me a little bit, and we're gonna try something different uh, to kind of illustrate the why instead of me actually speaking to it. So we'll see how this works, and if you all have a smart watch like I do that reminds you that it's time to get up and move around, I'm gonna help you out a little bit on that. Um, so first of all, I'd like to ask our IACD team um, if you wouldn't mind kind of standing up for us. Okay. So you can see we have a pretty good sized team. Um, it was about a quarter of that size back in 2014. And could I ask our uh, NSA and DHS sponsors to please stand up too? Okay, so as you look, this team here, this is basically what IECD was back in, in the beginning. It was a small contingent of APL and our government sponsors who had ideas, who had a vision, and were trying to put that vision into action, right? Um, now I'm going to ask, if you're a vendor 
in, in the audience who's been part of this, worked with us, uh, maybe supported these concepts that we've been dealing with with automation. If I could ask you to please stand up. Okay, if you're an in, from an integration, and representing an integration company who's out there delivering these capabilities, um, if you could stand up for us. Okay, we have a few. Okay, if you're from the threat sharing community, right, the ISACs, the ISOWs, uh, the AISs, folks who are actually sharing and automating the, that uh, uh, sharing of information, could you please stand up for us? Okay, and finally, uh, we don't want to forget the fact our, our customer organizations, right? If you've been out there and you are an organization who has either adopted some of these concepts or thinking about adopting them, that's why you're here is to learn about them, I'm going to ask you to please stand up. Okay, and I've been told I cannot forget our, our, our partners in the education community, right? Uh, those folks who are out there doing research in this field, just like APL, trying to push the state of the art, if you can stand up. Okay, and if you're still sitting, then I, I apologize because it's probably my ignorance that I've overlooked a portion of our, of our audience here. Um, but I want you to look around now, right? okay? Think about that group that was standing up uh, at the beginning and take a look around now. Because to us, you are what IECD has become, right? It has become this community of the folks in this room now and the folks who are, uh, not, could not be with us today because, for whatever reason who have been supporting this, these concepts over the years. Please, you can go ahead and sit down. So that is why when we, well, this will be our last integrated cyber event. It's because integrated cyber has evolved. Right? It has become you all and the community that has taken some of those early thoughts, foundational pieces that may have been developed here at APL um, and made them real. Right? You all have been out there working in this space and have made it real. And in some ways, you have taken those thoughts and leapfrogged where we could have ever um, imagined going. Right? So that is a big part of why um, this will be our last integrated cyber event. Okay, so you may be thinking, well, what does that mean? What are you really saying? Are you saying that IECD is, is over, it's going away? Um, no, not at all, absolutely not at all. IECD will still continue because it is no longer just about uh, APL, it is about the community. And it needs to evolve, however, to represent this community. So we actually will be posting this logo um, on our website within the next, hopefully, 24, 48 hours um, that you can actually use as part of this community. Um, and we will continue to have our IECD website and our LinkedIn presence and those type of things to be able to share information among the community. All right? If you're not part of those things, by all means, please go out and, and look them up. Um, but we want you to be able to take this logo, to be able to download it, and to use it. Um, to talk about the work that you're doing in this space uh, and to be able to keep the momentum going um, as we move forward, right? Okay, so IECD will not end um, just because we're, we will no longer be having integrated cyber events here. Um, and so what about APL, right? What about the work that we have been doing and what are we, are, are, are we done? Are we finished? Um, absolutely not. Right, so I, I will talk to you a little bit about that from the perspective of what have we been doing over the last six months and what are the things that we intend to focus on. Because part of the, the core of uh, reason for, uh, for dealing with integrated cyber is the fact that APL, we need to have an opportunity to get back in our team and focus on some of that core research um, and the things that we can do to help evolve the state of the art of uh, security automation. So I want to talk about the shareable workflows uh, effort. So um, I'm a huge fan of this work. I love this, this work because in my mind it takes the concepts of information sharing and integration to a, to a completely different level, right? Um, if you think back, we've had 
a lot of work going on in developing playbooks. And our definition of that playbook is that uh, higher level process, right? Those, those cyber defense processes that are, you can document and you document the steps and, and you provide, we've provided information to organizations on what are the pieces and components and how do you then take that and apply that into your environment. Well, the workflows is, is another level down and step down from that. It's actually taking those playbooks and instantiating those into a workflow that can be shared. Um, and actually document them in, in, what, in uh, BPMN format, the business process modeling notation format, that you can then share across organizations and automatically ingest those into your orchestration capabilities, right? So we've had two um, outstanding partners in Demisto and Cyberspons that have partnered with us and worked with us in, in developing this capability. And we'll actually have uh, Paul Laskowski and Triton Patasi will be talking a bit about this. Um, I think it's in our first uh, breakout session today. So phenomenal work for how you can bring that in and share this information out um, and share these workflows. So I highly encourage you to um, take a look at that work. The other effort is Mosaics. Um, so Mosaic stands for uh, more situational awareness for ICS, right? It's, a, it's an effort, we've talked about it here um, at integrated cyber events in the past. Um, and it's really about taking from a APL perspective and we have partners um, across the DOD, it's a, it's a DOD Navy led effort um, in partnership with the DOE National Labs, uh, some of our combatant commands um, and APL, right? And it's, for APL, it's about taking those concepts of automation and automated information sharing and applying them to this particular uh, problem set, right? And looking at these environments. So when we've talked about it before, a lot of it was about some of the concepts that we were trying to do with Mosaics. Um, but we've actually taken and implemented our, our first uh, reference implementation here at APL uh, to implement portions of the, mosa uh, the Mosaics effort. Uh, we did it as a spiral zero, right, kind of modeling off of that IECD spiral zero of prove you can do something, show you can make it real. So that was our, uh, our effort. I will actually be talking about uh, the details of this in breakout session three later today. Uh, and we'll talk about that. We'll show a little bit of a, a demonstration of this work. And uh, the third effort that's been consuming a lot of our time over the last six months, um, and if you've been here in integrated cyber before, uh, you've heard us talk about the need to evolve um, and think maybe a little bit differently about what we do from an information sharing perspective, right? Um, I've stood up here and talked about the need to move past just the sharing of indicators, uh, indicators of compromise. Um, and that's an, we feel is an important concept to really think about the evolution of, of information sharing. Uh, IOCs are valuable, they're, net, they're needed, um, but they are limited from a, a time constraint perspective, right? There's a limited amount of time that an indicator of compromise is valuable, right? Um, and at times, it certainly feels like we're making it harder on the network defenders who have to consume all this information um, and act upon it, then maybe we are actually are on the, the folks who are attacking um, our systems, right? Um, think about a piece of malware that can be evolved um, and tweaked to quickly and easily have a different file hash or, or avoid a signature of some sort, right? Very simple for the attacker to do that. And frankly, that's an infinite problem set. Right? You can never get your hands around that because they can always change it in some way or fashion. So we've been looking at and working with our, our uh, partners at Palo Alto and looking at the MITRE ATT&CK framework and taking the, uh, a view of what other types of information can we be sharing, um, more along the lines of tactics and techniques, that if we can take those, if we can identify and share those tactics and take those away from the adversary, now we may have impacted that adversary a lot more, right? Because we can get our hands around. There are only so many ways you can um, obtain persistence, for example, within a, a box or an operating system. 
It's a finite problem. It may still be dozens or even a hundred different ways, but it's not a, an infinite problem. And if we can get our hands around that, could we be more uh, impactful against the adversary? So tomorrow we have uh, Jason Mock and, and others from our team who will be talking a bit about the work that we've done in that area over the last six months. Okay, so I did promise to talk for a few minutes about um, our roadmap, what's next? What are the things that we wanted to focus on coming up? And there are really four main areas. I've already talked a little bit about the information sharing piece. We've been working on that already. We feel like there's more to be done, um, and I think you'll see that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these other areas, these three other areas. So first is um, security of automation, and that, those are the words, but I'm gonna expand it a little bit and talk more about it from a trust perspective, a little broader, the broader concept of trust, um, because trust is something that is very difficult to build, but it's extremely easy to, to lose, right? Um, it takes time, it takes effort to build up trust, and it only takes one, one incident, one problem, before we lose the confidence we have in the things that we've done. So in some ways, I look at that trust and, and that security as kind of the Achilles heel of the work we've been, do we've been doing. We need to focus on it. Uh, we, have been, we have done work on the security piece in the past, um, but we think there's more to be done around the broader concepts of trust. We actually have, have a, uh, developed a trust framework, you see represented up here, um, to help us think about the bigger aspects of the problem, what all is involved uh, from that, right? What happens if we under-trust, as an organization, the automation, and what can we do to help that organization um, improve their trust levels, right? If they are under trusting and don't want to take um, action and, uh, and, and implement the automation. But also the flip side, what happens if we over trust, right? What could be the danger in that and how do we help ensure that organizations look at that aspect um, and are able to properly monitor the automation that they put in place? So we actually have a, um, Jennifer Ackerman has been a, our lead for a lot of this, our trust initiative. And we actually have her and a number of folks um, on a panel, uh, some leaders from industry who have been thinking in, and, and doing work in this space, um, coming in and talking about uh, this particular topic tomorrow. So more to be done for that, from that perspective and it's certainly an area that APL would like to focus on um, going forward. All right, so if anybody out there is playing uh, buzzword bingo. I now hit a couple right here, right? You can't go to a security conference these days and not hear the words artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? Um, and they, they're, they're promised for what they can do for us uh, in a cybersecurity perspective. Um, whether you are a believer working in this space or a naysayer, um, the one thing that I will say in the one area of, of automation where we've not seen it advance as quickly has been in that decision-making and that decision support area, right? We do a lot of automation to help, help operators gather information, do things, to put it in a queue for a person to sit and wait, hopefully minutes, but often hours, maybe even days, before they then take the action um, on that information, right? That's not gonna get us to where we need to be. So does artificial intelligence, does machine learning help us overcome that, uh, those aspects. And what happens and how do, the, the, do those technologies fit into the ecosystem that we've built um, to date, right? So we've, we talk about the fact of a bring your own enterprise concept, right? Where we have a lot of tools and capabilities and it's about integrating those technologies together. Um, but what happens if you introduce uh, these type of capabilities and the algorithms are working on data that may not be generated or collected by that capability. It has to reach out and pull in data from other sources. What happens as far as the provenance of the data? How do you look at that? What does it do to the confidence of potentially decisions that are being made? So an area we will be focusing on, um, very interested in this. We actually have uh, folks here starting to explore more about what's happening out in industry in this, in this space, because we know a lot's been going on. 
Um, but we really want to understand that e the broader ecosystem aspect of, uh, of this. Okay, and finally, um, the last area is some of the evolving architectures, right? We don't have uh, static environments. Our architectures are changing, they're evolving. Um, we're very interested in looking at other aspects. We've talked a little bit about control systems, uh, but what about data-centric environments? We've, we've thought a lot about that, uh, where how does automation play in an environment where it's about protecting the data and I don't have control over the underlying infrastructure that that data resides on. So cloud is a simple, uh, is a simple example, um, one folks are very familiar with, and of course, there's also these, the concepts of zero trust and micro-segmentation and those type of things. How does the automation fit? How does orchestration and those type of capabilities fit into these evolving environments? So it's an area where we're very interested in um, exploring as we move forward. Okay. So we've talked about the fact that IECD is not going away. APL still has work to do, and we'll be focusing over the upcoming months on some of these areas. Um, but you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. I, uh, integrated cyber is where we've come to, to gather as a community um, and learn about what's happening in this space. Find out what the vendors are doing. Find out the lessons learned. Um, and that's important. We would agree with that. We absolutely would agree with that. What we would say, though, however, is it shouldn't be uh, a separate event that you have to come to APL to learn about. Right? It really needs to be integrated into uh, the conferences and the events where you go to learn the latest and greatest in cybersecurity. So we actually have uh, embarked on a partnership. Whoa, what happened? Okay. Wow, that was interesting. All right, so, yeah, so something happened with my presentation. Um, okay, uh, nonetheless, we have embarked on a partnership with the OASIS group um, to actually help and work the, to implement a track, a three-day track at the Borderless Cyber event in the fall. Um, that is, if you're not familiar with Borderless Cyber, um, it is an event, it's in DC. It's a much larger, it's actually run in partnership with, with another event. Um, we will actually be working with them to uh, put on a track dedicated to security automation and automated information sharing. So I apologize with, with, for the, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the mess up with the slide, uh, but there is information in your, in your handouts. Um, the OASIS folks are out here. Uh, they have a table in the community section, um, and you can go find out more about it. Uh, registration for Borderless Cyber is now open, and there is also an open call for papers. So if you are interested in presenting the work you're doing, um, please seek that out, submit your abstracts. We will be working with them to look at the content and, and ensuring that we have a really good uh, technical content for that, that event. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about today. I will mention one other thing, and that is a, uh, we are also working with the Center for Internet Security um, to produce a journal around the evolution of security automation. Um, Mr. Uh, Phil Reitinger is uh, part of that work and has agreed to support some of the, uh, that work since he has been a thought leader in this space, along with, you mentioned Tony Sager, uh, a, a former boss and colleague of mine. Um, for many years, so we are working with them to put on and produce this journal. Uh, Kim Watson, uh, you want to raise your hand, Kim, or stand up? And uh, she is our she is our lead for that effort. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that journal, potentially how you may be able to contribute to, toward it, um, please uh, track Kim down on a break, and uh, we would love to have your your input on that. One year, I leave you for one year, and what do you go off and do? Uh, when Harley called me and asked me, uh, I, I had just registered for the event, and I have not been here. It was a year ago today, actually, that was my last event leading IACD. It was the last IC session that I was part of. 
Um, and when he called me, I had just registered. I had not been backed. And I really thought he was calling me to ask me not to come. That some, <laughs> like, he can tell you that. I picked up in the car and I'm like, are you telling me I can't come? He said, no, I want you to come here and sort of be like the, the emeritus old person who talks about back in my day. So, <laughs> so I'm going to do that, which is cool because frequently I don't get to be that person. Um, so, and I think I know what happened to your slides because I, I was not going to have any slides. And for those of you who had worked with me in the past, that's sort of stunning, right? I will tell you in the time that I have left, I have literally used PowerPoint three times and once was this morning in the Dunkin' Donuts where having looked at Harley's slides, I decided to mess with them. Uh, <laughs> so, and I don't know which is, so I wanted to go back to what Harley had placed up and what he had talked through um, because he really was saying, how has this community evolved? Where did we start in terms of a community day or an outreach where we really began to say, what are the partnerships amongst this audience? And I just wanted to zoom out to a slightly broader view, I suppose. And so I wanted to talk about how prehistory informs where you're going with the future, where I've learned that you all are going. I have to admit I've kept a very low profile in this community haven't been involved in a lot, but I watch the, the LinkedIn updates and I watch the YouTube channel. And I occasionally do Twitter, but Phil's really the guy on Twitter that I follow, so I have to be very clear on that. Um, but if you think about before we crawled out of the, the ooze, you know, in the pre-amoeba stage or whatever the right answer is, um, and it's hilarious that you brought this up, I think about the information sharing world and the early conversations we had about how information sharing tied to action could change things. And the very first time I ever encountered Phil Reitinger was in a discussion over how agencies should, should partner for information sharing. And there was this paper written in 2011. And we were pointing to that and marking things up and arguing about how NSA and DHS had to work together. The fact that you brought this up is amazing because that's what I was thinking about this morning. Um, and there's a whole group of us that were, have been talking about this for a long time. But even before that, and this goes to the interoperability, all the people that, that Harley just mentioned, that I've had the honor of working with, that all of you have been working with for a long time, we've been talking about interoperability before we called it cyber. We've been talking about IA standards when we were talking about networking security. We've all been working this. I remember the... Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative was where a lot of us, having worked sort of pairwise, first got together, but it was all still very government-centric. We were absolutely convinced that the right amount of government direction to all of you would save the world. You know, we're from the government and we're here to help. And that's where I sort of went to our prehistory. Then I fast forward through what Harley talked about and what this organization has done. And to me, I, I was looking at, you know, there's the prehistory of how this community evolved and how we were very siloed. We're siloed in domains, we're siloed in agencies. We, government absolutely believed they needed to bring the tablets out and provide you with the information, and if you would all just do the right thing, it will happen. Um, but I also think about my own evolution. Uh, I entered that early phase. I joined CNCI activities, and I was an old school Navy trained systems engineer. I can waterfall. I, I can use doors. I can use rational roads. You want a DODAF document, I was able to provide it to you. And none of that seemed to have any impact whatsoever on the security of our systems or the evolution of what we're going to do for cybersecurity. And so I was evolving. Our communities and our thoughts were evolving. We eventually moved through, and, and we talked about five years ago, you know, the first spiral ended in July five years ago, but five years ago this week, just like one year ago this week was mine, five years ago this week was when IACD as a project was stood up by DHS here at APL. And I had been working for NSA on active cyber defense, which was a precursor, and that was the point where both sponsors stepped back and said, we're doing this wrong. This is never going to be a major government acquisition program. We need to partner with industry. We need to partner with research. What if we did it a different way? Um, and so it's amazing that even in the five years between those two things, 
I got to witness the evolution of, of a community thought, and I got to change quite a bit of things. So what happens moving forward? I had a great opportunity to, to work with all of you. Um, what have I been doing in the last year? When I stood up here a year ago, we had done a lot of things. One of the most significant things that we were able to talk about was our expansion to multiple critical in infrastructure sectors. Now critical, na I, critical national functional, okay, yeah, <laughs> whatever that was. Uh, but in there, we had the benefit of, we, we, had had a, we had told you for a year we were working with some code words, emu, ostrich, cassowary. We had large flightless birds that were actually banks and financial institutions that were working with us. I got to stand up here a year ago today and, and reveal our partners who were standing up saying, hey, we tried this out. We want to be able to talk openly about how we're partnering with you. Um, and as it turns out, I decided to go join that crowd. I was so intrigued. I was so interested in all this talk we've done for a long time. I'm seeing this sector embrace this. I want to go try and do. Um, so full disclosure, or actually full non-disclosure, I'm not representing my employer. I'm not talking here as a representative of the financial institution I work for, and I'm sure you're good at Google, but no, I'm, I'm not even going to place that up there. Um, but I am talking about someone who made the leap out of the DOD tower, out of the ivory tower of Hopkins, out of the intelligence center, or something, 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 we ever want to call it, and tried to go out there and do. And so I've learned a few things in that interim. First, I've learned a great deal of humility. For every time that I stood up here in the last five years and talked to you all about how easy it should be to adopt, or if you would just do this, I have colleagues sitting here, I am so sorry. <laughs> it is not easy to adopt, and the fact that you have to keep a network, an amazingly complex, continually driven network, one that is used for your company to give information out to Wall Street about earnings, and one that is used for all of your customers to protect their money from their mortgage payment up to their major financing for their capital investment. It is not easy for us to talk about this adoption. And so the critical work that happened about a year, year and a half ago, more than that, where we started talking about how do we scale to integration services, who can offer companies to do that, and how do we directly work with operational communities for them to talk about adoption, Thank you to this community. I think you've done a lot. I think what's critical is that you need to be able to continue doing that even more in that group. Do not let that sort of fusion of what the community go, uh, because it, it's way harder than I thought. It is way harder. Uh, and so what's the real future of, of cybersecurity? Obviously, it's women in power in cyber. No, that was just for Harley, because he had to use the guy thing. Um, <laughs> Obviously. No, it's, um, it is the community and it's the continuation of the community. This is still the only place I have ever seen the diversity of different types of organizations where Harley had you each, you know, government, research organizations, systems integrators, operational users, vendors, all of those coming together. Don't lose that. Just because we think we've matured a set of concepts so much so that it can now survive in the wild. That's great. What's the next thing we're incubating? So I'm really looking forward to continue to participate in the, the work that we're doing and that's transitioning to Oasis and to other organizations, but I'm also going to stay on that channel. I'm going to find out what's the next, thing, I don't know, the second next humor, hu superhuman thing. I want to do one thing, and I get to do this, even though Dan's telling me to get off stage. So this is my application management and continuous deployment AMCD DevOps Roadrunner. Uh, my team has changed the way that we're organizing our work, and we're focused on an agile application of DevOps with the goal of moving towards automation. Um, and I didn't even realize it when we talked about this, but apparently flightless birds live on. So if my organization can do it, so can yours. Thanks.